Okay, so let's get moving again. We're talking now about emissions, and I'm going to focus mostly on NOx and soot emissions. However, <clears throat> as far as the EPA is concerned, you know, there are standards in place for ozone, uh, the particulate matter, and in various size categories, CO, sulfur dioxide, nitrogen oxides, lead, and so on. In addition to that, there are the so-called hazardous air pollutants uh, uh, that are basically implicated with health concerns. Uh, there's 188 of these that have been identified from exhaust of gasoline engines for instance, and diesel engines. So, you know, this is an area where uh, the industry basically has to tread very, very cautiously. Uh, and then, of course, there are these mobile source air toxics. There's 21 compounds. Benzene is a big one that people are concerned about because of health uh, uh, implications there. Uh, the dienes, uh, aldehydes, and particulate matter has really been the focus of a lot of, of uh, legislation. Some of these uh, things that appear in uh, engine exhaust uh, have effects on the central nervous system, the BTEX, benzene, toluene, xylenes, the, the aromatic compounds. So they're bad news and uh, really uh, need to be um, addressed. However, <clears throat> most of the concern recently has been in nitric oxides and soot. Uh, and actually, uh, this plot I got from Eric Curtis at Ford is really interesting uh, because it shows back in 1970, during that, uh, the period where I was mentioning the oil crisis, engines were putting out hydrocarbon, unburned hydrocarbon and NOx to the level of you know, 14 grams per mile. And when you compare that with what happened after the three-way catalyst was introduced, uh, we're down basically 99.8% uh, reduction uh, from those days. And the LEV3 here, they are even asking for 0 0.03 for this number. So that's a huge reduction in uh, engine out um, emissions, thanks to the three-way catalyst. So the gasoline engine really has that advantage. <clears throat> If you look at the diesel engine, though, again, diesel engine is in of interest because of its superior fuel efficiency. Uh, there have been several uh, concepts discussed of how to meet the EPA 2010 heavy duty emissions legislation numbers. Soot at 0 0.01 gram per kilowatt hour, NOx at 0.26 or 27 kilogram, gram per kilowatt hour, rather. Uh, in the early 2000s, both Navistar and Cummins uh, and other companies suggested that these could be met by using large quantities of exhaust gas recirculated to basically dilute the combustion process. Uh, but to do that, that required redesigning the combustion bowl, uh, improving EGR valves, uh, addressing the air handling issues, uh, superior turbocharging, high injection pressures to mix the fuel in the air. Uh, and basically, uh, at the end of the day, Navistar was not successful in using uh, in-cylinder control for NOx and soot. And that caused a lot of issues for the company. Uh, actually, in those early days in 2000, uh, Cummins also went this path. But toward the end of the race, they realized that they would need uh, selective catalytic reduction. And so they introduced uh, catalysts with diesel exhaust fluid for 2010. And because combustion phasing is one of the knobs you have for NOx control, they were able to advance the combustion event and gain in fuel economy. Uh, they claimed 3 to 5% improvement in fuel economy by going to the SCR system. So here's a picture of the SCR system. Uh, you can have, of course, EGR, but you take your exhaust, valve, uh, exhaust gases, pass them through a diesel particulate filter, uh, and then you add urea or carbamide, this molecule here, uh, which serves to reduce the NO species to create nitrogen, and that would be your SCR catalyst job. 
This type of fuel economy gain is of great interest to a trucker because a trucker spends $100,000 a year on fuel. So 1% is you know, $1,000, so it's very interesting to him. So I think that was part of the reason for the sell here. Uh, but what people didn't emphasize was that you're gonna need this extra fuel uh, and basically dosing rates that are on the order of several percent. Um, and at the time, it was very uncertain what the cost of this stuff would be. Uh, for example, in Germany, AdBlue was, is used for diesel uh, exhaust uh, fluid, and that, I believe, is still on the order of $10 a gallon. So that's pretty expensive stuff, especially if you're using it at the, at the rate of several percent of your fuel flow consumption. The other thing is the cost of the after-treatment system. So in 2004, the, the particulate uh, emission standards uh, were required, and they, that's what introduced the, uh, the particulate filter. Uh, according to Volvo, this cost about $7,000 for a, a truck system to implement. It's not a simple filter that has to be uh, regenerated periodically to burn off the accumulated soot that requires very intricate controls, monitoring the, the pressure drop across the filter, uh, deciding when to enrich in the mixture so you can burn off the, create high enough temperatures to burn off the, the accumulated soot. So that was quite expensive. But then adding the SCR, according to Volvo, added another $9,000 to the cost of an engine. Very complicated here as well because this diesel exhaust fluid has to be able to survive over wide temperature ranges. It freezes at 12 degrees F and it gasifies at 130 F. Um, and the dosing rate has to be such that you don't create ammonia uh, and other unwanted species. Very complicated system. So adding these two numbers, you can see that the cost of the after treatment system is about the same as the cost of the actual diesel engine which is amazing. A huge increase in cost to be able to meet these uh, emissions targets. So it's of great interest to look to see if there are other ways that you can effectively meet those emissions regulations uh, less expensively. All right, so that's uh, one of the reasons why we're interested in developing models for nitric oxide and for particulates. And I'm just gonna very quickly go through some of these models because we don't have a huge amount of time left today. Uh, but basically, the NOx models, at least for high temperature situations, are pretty well established. The Zeldovich NOx mechanism, the shuffle reactions where basically the uh, oxygen molecule has a lower bond energy, so we have O radicals available before we have nitrogen, uh, which has a higher bond energy. Um, and so that leads to the first NO here, but we get an N, which then uh, continues the shuffle to create additional NO, O radicals, and so on. This is uh, sometimes, uh, or generally, ex uh, complemented with the extended NOx model, the uh, extended NO model. Um, there are other models that are more, uh, that, that are based on the Gas Research Institute mechanism. Uh, that's a mechanism that has, I think it's about 30 steps, uh, 30 reaction steps for NOx. Uh, we've looked at simplifications of that and have produced a 12-step NOx model. There are also extensions that I'll just discuss briefly that include cyano species. So there's a connection between the carbonaceous fuel and fuel-bound nitrogen, also ammonia. Uh, so let me just talk briefly about some of those uh, aspects of NOx modeling. So uh, there are various tools. Uh, Senkin is a related tool to Chemkin that allows you to essentially look at fluxes of, uh, or reaction steps and the fluxes of, of uh, species that undergo those particular reactions. And they would look like this. Uh, here you're looking at uh, several species, O, uh, OH, H, H2O, O2, N, NO, and so on. Um, and you can identify uh, during the reaction which paths seem to be those that are the most important uh, for producing 
NO. So that's a powerful tool that we've also used. And that's what helped us to develop the 12-step NOx model that's shown over here. So you identify the Zeldovich models here. And then there's other steps that involve two extra species, N2O and NO2. Uh, and so basically, these, this is our 12-step NOx model. Um, what I'm showing you here is a spray simulation where we looked at spray combustion. And we compared the predicted field at a given time. Uh, this is injection into a constant volume uh, apparatus. Project the, uh, compare the, the predicted field of NO, NO2, uh, N2O, obtained with the full GRI mechanism versus our 12-step model. And you can see the results are very, very similar. Um, so this uh, particular case was for a lifted flame. So the combustion process basically uh, started some distance downstream of the nozzle here. <clears throat> and um, what uh, is evident is that the NOx starts to appear in the high temperature regions uh, downstream. Okay, so that's uh, the model that we have used quite widely. But there also an interesting connection between the NOx and the CH radicals through the uh, cyano species, or uh, fuel-bound nitrogen species. Uh, basically, if you start with a fuel such as uh, eth an ethane, uh, you can identify reaction steps that lead to CH species, or CXHY species. Um, under stoichiometric or lean conditions, there's really no connection between the CH species and the nitrogen uh, chemistry. Nitrogen chemistry involves basically uh, N atoms and NO2, NO, um, NO2 N2O, uh, and there's no connection. But if you go to a rich situation, there's actually a competition for the CH species between the soot path, all right, and a path that leads to HCN here, which participates in the nitric oxide uh, reduction steps. So that's kind of interesting that there's actually uh, the chemistry of NO formation uh, starts to involve the hydrocarbon uh, under rich conditions. So we developed models that, in, that include those steps as well, but basically for most of the uh, operating conditions that are of interest to us, it's really the 12-step model that uh, we use. Okay, we were talking about soot radiation and the cooling that occurs due to soot radiation and its effect on NOx. Um, so here are some simulations that uh, I'm showing you here. Uh, each of these dots represents one computational cell in our computational domain. And we're looking at some point during the combustion process. Uh, this is a plot of the local equivalence ratio in that cell versus the temperature of that cell. And what we've done is we've identified uh, full symbol circles here as cells where the NOx is being formed. And the open symbols here is where the NOx is being reduced. And as you can see, uh, once you get to richer mixtures, uh, there's actually reaction steps that take you from NOx back to N2 species, um, which is kind of interesting. So that's going on in an engine. Uh, and uh, Mark Musculus at the Sandia National Labs uh, made an argument that there's a connection between soot radiation or the amount of soot that you find in a computational cell or in an, at a particular location in his engine and the nitric oxide. So he had these uh, engine cases here. Uh, this is standard diesel combustion where he changed the start of injection timing over a wide range from minus 12 degrees, that's 12 before top dead center, to 15 degrees after top dead center. And you're seeing the pressure traces here. The dotted lines are the simulation results. Uh, solid lines, I think, are his experiments. Maybe it's the other way around. The solid lines are the experiment. The dotted lines are the calculation. But we were able to match pretty well uh, his results over a wide range. Uh, he also has the, uh, the line of sight uh, soot absorption measurements here, and from that could determine uh, 
um, details about soot uh, in the engine as a function of crank angle. So on the left uh, top plot is Mark's measurements of NOx uh, out of the engine as a function of start of injection timing. And as you expect, as you retard the start of injection, it's less time for NOx to form. And so you see a big decrease in NOx. This is in grams per kilogram fuel. But he noticed here something interesting. When he tracked the soot, there was a corresponding decrease in soot. And at a certain moment, the soot disappeared. And he noticed an increase in NOx that corresponded to that soot uh, disappearance. And this was his argument then that basically the radiation that's occurring from the soot here was no longer occurring because the soot disappeared. And that led to an increase in NOx. So that's the only evidence that I know of to support this directly. We've tried to model this, and we can kind of see a little bit of a bump here, but not as much as, as his experiments show. But it stands to reason, right, that if you're radiating away energy locally from combustion, uh, that that is going to be cooling the mixture locally. So then let's look at the particulates. <coughs> um, this plot here is kind of interesting because it basically shows the size range of particles that we deal with in our lives, right? Going from molecules uh, all the way up here to the limit of vision, um, pollen, cells, and so on, bacteria. For soot, uh, the regulated emissions are what they call PM 2.5. Um, this uh, particulate mass basically um, is divided into uh, regions of particle size. Uh, here's a plot that uh, um, Dave Kittleson has uh, produced, which shows as a function of the size of the particles, the various modes of soot or particle production. There's the nucleation um, mode seen here. This is where soot particles are formed from gas phase species, gas phase molecules down at this end of the scale. And then the accumulation mode where those uh, nucleation particles can coalesce or grow, and we'll discuss that in a minute, uh, and the size of the particle accumulates or increases. And so the legislated emissions uh, have typically dealt with the integral under this curve, which gives you the total mass of particulates. Uh, but more recently, uh, the number density of particles has become of concern. So for example, in uh, the California uh, Air Resources Board, LEV3, not only are they legislating particle mass, uh, 3.8 milligram per kilometer or 1.9 in uh, 2017, but also particle number. And this is measured basically uh, respectively in 2017 at 1.9, 10 to the 12 particles per kilometer. So that's something that's a, a new dimension that uh, the automotive companies are struggling with right now, because now you have to actually measure the number of particles that are emitted in addition to the mass. Uh, this is also something that appears in Europe in the Euro 6, uh, proposed Euro 6 standards. OK, so how do you model soot? Well, there's a whole variety of soot models that we have looked at over the years, the simplest being the two-step model. I'll describe in the next slide or two. Uh, then phenomenological models, which basically take you to particles through a discussion that involves coalescence phenomena and particle growth phenomena. And those are all fed by some precursor species uh, and more recently, we have included PAH, uh, polyaromatic hydrocarbon chemistry, to try to derive more accurate estimates of these precursor species that really start the whole ball rolling. So let's look at the two-step model. This was uh, originally formulated by uh, Professor Hiriyasu, where he said that you, the net soot mass at every computational cell in a calculation depends on the difference between the soot particle formation or the soot formation rate, the soot mass formation rate, and the soot mass oxidation rate. So for the formation, 
he assumed an Arrhenius uh, type of expression with some constants here uh, that also depended on the pressure to some power uh, and the concentration of fuel. Well, we found pretty soon that that was not suitable. So we replaced the fuel concentration with the acetylene concentration where we calculate acetylene as part of our reaction mechanism. Uh, okay, so that uh, is the formation part. The oxidation part uh, is the nagel strickland uh, constable method or model, which basically tracks the or specifies the particle size here uh, and a set of reaction rates, rate constants, that depend on the amount of soot surface that is exposed to the oxygen. And I'll discuss that in a little more detail in a minute. But basically, it's a relatively simple model, uh, easy to implement, and it uh, allows you to predict uh, engine soot uh, behavior. Uh, there are a couple of tuning constants that can be used, and uh, there are some guidelines in publications that tell you how to choose those constants. Uh, when we first used this model to try to compare with uh, engine data or experimental data from Sandia National Lab, from Lyle Pickett's group, uh, we found there was a problem. Uh, Lyle presented the soot mass measurements uh, from uh, laser measurements in uh, these uh, sprays that you see over here um, as a function of distance from the injector. So if you just take a look at these plots here, you see at low temperatures, when the temperature in this vessel is low, you don't make any soot. But as you increase the temperature, certain moment you start to see soot radiation or evidence of soot appearing. Uh, this dotted line here is the location of the start of the flame. So there's a liftoff period uh, between where the fuel and the air is mixing before ignition occurs. And then downstream of that, you start to see soot appearing and then it's oxidized. And that's what this plot shows. When we used the two-step model, uh, we found that we we're starting to predict soot right at the liftoff length rather than at this uh, delayed location some distance downstream of the flame liftoff. So that means we needed some improvement. And the argument was that, that acetylene is only the beginning of the whole soot formation process, that there are additional precursor species that involve the PAHs that need to be considered to actually move this location downstream. Okay, so uh, here's a picture that kind of confirms that idea, again, from the Sandia experiments. It's a conceptual picture of the structure of a diesel flame. Um, so you inject your fuel, in this case, in heptane. It undergoes uh, decomposition reactions that produce the aldehyde, all right? Uh, at a certain moment, the flame uh, ignition process takes place. Uh, but in this rich region, and, and the flame is anchored here, this is the center line of the flame. In this rich fuel rich region, you form PAH species, complicated molecules, which eventually transition to soot. And that explains why there's this distance between the location of the flame and the start of soot, uh, the appearance of soot. So in the models, we then realized we had to uh, improve our. Uh, connection between the soot uh, and the uh, precursor species. Uh, this is a chart that just summarizes what I said here. So here we have the fuel chemistry that we've discussed already today uh, leading to uh, ignition. Um, on the rich side uh, of stoichiometric, we have species such as the acetylene that, that I discussed as a soot precursor, also the propargyl. Uh, radicals that uh, combine to form phenol and uh, aromatic species. Um, these species then grow through uh, the growth of the PAH species uh, and eventually produce soot particles or nucleate to form soot particles. Those particles can coagulate, they can undergo further growth through the addition of uh, acetylene type species. And uh, of course, during this whole process, they're competing with local oxidation through the NSC mechanism. So that's basically shown in this diagram up here. 
uh, soot precursors, the nucleation of, to particles, the growth and coalescence of those particles, and agglomeration to form soot. Um, so <clears throat> we looked in the literature and we found that there are PAH mechanisms available, such as the ones listed here that go back to Frank Leck's work. Uh, we uh, created a reduced mechanism that's just 20 species and 52 additional reactions that allow you to track from the beginning the first ring formation, uh, the first aromatic ring, uh, and then all the way through to the fourth aromatic, uh, what is called A4 here, uh, pyrene, plus intermediate uh, species. And here just shows some of the reaction steps, basically the propargyl forming the first aromatic ring uh, and subsequent growth to create second aromatic ring and so on up to the pyrene. And uh, the idea was that then instead of relying on acetylene as being your precursor, you could then uh, look at the uh, higher order PAHs. Okay, so going back to the experiments from Sandia, Here's the experimental result. Here we're showing the soot. Uh, let's see, what is this? This is PPM, uh, soot concentration, uh, which of course is a maximum. And then soot oxidation decreases the uh, soot uh, formed for a particular operating condition. Here's the lifted flame, and our injector would be on the left here, so we're injecting to the right. Here's the CFD prediction. And in this case, I think the, the uh, we used uh, the phenanthrene, but as a precursor. But if you look at the details, this is a log plot here showing the uh, precursor concentrations um, on this axis, or mass actually in, on this axis, and then distance from the injector. Here's the acetylene. Here's the experimental soot mass. Uh, if you look at the first ring compound, A1, it's slightly displaced from the acetylene, at the start of the acetylene. Uh, then comes A2, A3, A4. And so between A2 and A3, sorry, A3 and A4 here is pretty much where the, the observed soot starts. So a model that uses those PAH species instead of uh, acetylene as the precursor uh, is more successful. So that's what we've done in our soot model, which I'm just showing you here. Soot inception occurs through pyrene, uh, and that forms the soot uh, particle or the graphitization step with a certain rate that's taken from the literature. Uh, then we have the uh, acetylene-assisted surface growth. Uh, again, steps here that uh, allow you to uh, increase the number of nascent soot particles. The rates here are quite complex because they also depend on the soot surface area. Uh, this is from Leung's paper. Um, so the square root of the surface area. Now, in order to calculate the soot surface area, you need to know the size of the soot particle. So to calculate the size of the soot particle, we need to know the soot mass fraction and also the number density of soot in each computational cell. And I'll show you how we do that uh, in a minute. <clears throat> but basically, we assume that there is one particle size in each computational cell. However, the size of the particles can be different as you go from one computational cell to the next. So this really keeps track, if you like, of an average soot particle size in each computational cell. Soot coagulation, again, uh, is part of the model of Leung with certain prescribed rates that depend on the soot uh, number density as well and the uh, mass fraction of soot the temperature as well as rate constants and the mass of soot. Uh, this, the oxidation process occurs through the two steps, the nagel strickland constable model that I mentioned earlier, where you account for uh, uh, reactive and less reactive sites on the surface of the soot particle with certain rate constants that are well established in the literature to determine the oxidation of the soot particles. And this is, of course, the competition here is through OH oxidation uh, through the Fenimore and Jones model, which again depends on temperature and various other parameters. Uh, and then we also have the PAH 
uh, assisted surface growth, so not just through, acet uh, through acetylene, but also through PAHs, which uh, basically combine with the soot particles to create uh, more soot. And again, uh, you can see the, the, the parameters are required here, including the size of the soot particle. All right, so how do you get those? Well, we solve transport equations to, come, to keep track of the soot mass or species density. And another transport equation, so M can either be rho times Y and the mass fraction of soot, or another transport equation for the number density. So N being our uh, uh, particle number per unit volume. You can see this transport equation has convection terms, it has diffusion terms, and also considers thermophoresis, where soot particles can be transported down a temperature gradient. Uh, and that turns out to be something that uh, should be considered. Plus the source terms, which I just discussed. Those are the source terms due to the various steps, the soot formation steps, the oxidation steps, uh, and so on. All right, so if I know the mass fraction of soot and the number density, I can calculate a particle size, and then that's used in the model to complete uh, the, un the necessary input. So let me just show a couple of results uh, that we've obtained recently using the soot model that I've described. Um, so this is uh, in an SAE paper from this year, uh, Qi Zhao. Uh, this is the computational mesh that we were looking at. It's a fairly good resolution mesh. And we're looking at a pre-mixed charge spark ignition engine. And we're looking at particulate modeling uh, for this case. <clears throat> Qi's uh, PhD thesis also looks at uh, diffusion, uh, or, or rather direct injection cases. But here I'm going to just discuss pre-mixed charge. So we have a homogeneous mixture of gasoline and air. We ignite it with a spark and we look at soot production. Uh, compression ratio is 12 to 1. Uh, engine uh, bore is around 86 millimeters. Uh, engine speed is 2100 RPM. Uh, you can see it's a realistic combustion chamber with a pent roof and a flat top piston in this case. So this is an engine that we actually had available at the Engine Research Center. It was uh, fed with EPA Triple E certification uh, gasoline, which has 28% aromatics. In our simulations, we uh, represented the fuel using isooctane blended with toluene uh, to try to uh, capture the effect of the aromatics. Um, it turns out the aromatics have a significant effect because that pathway that leads to the first aromatic ring, you already have aromatics in the fuel. So that's something to consider in soot modeling. We also use that DPIC ignition model and the G equation model here. And then the multi-chem chemistry model with isooctane, n-heptane, PAHs, and, and so on. 79 species. So if you look at the soot <coughs> formation uh, versus crank angle, we had experimental data for a variety of operating conditions going from very lean combustion with overall equivalence ratio of 0.78 to rich combustion with equivalence ratio 1.5. And you can see with rich combustion, you make a lot of soot and it's oxidized. Uh, and whereas with lean combustion, you make very little soot as you might expect. So the, these are the predicted uh, results, all right? Um, if we look, we see by a crank angle of about 80 degrees after top dead center, the soot is kind of equilibrated and uh, that's what we would consider to be the engine out suit. Uh, if you look inside the combustion chamber at top dead center, when you're just starting to form the soot here, uh, we're comparing the lean operating case and the rich operating case. Uh, the flame has propagated to, out to these uh, purple regions that you see here. The contours, the color contours that are shown inside here show soot concentration. And you see much higher soot levels, uh, especially around the flame uh, in both cases. But in the lean case, there's very little soot left at the center of the combustion <coughs> chamber where the spark plug was located. So this is uh, uh, some very early in the combustion process. 
if we look later at 80 degrees after type dead center, you see for the lean case, uh, this was uh, 0.7 here, very little soot, what little there is locates in the region close to the liner. Whereas for the rich case, you can see quite a lot of soot remaining in the combustion chamber. So to try to quantify that a little bit, uh, what we looked at was just one representative uh, location in the engine across the bore. So we basically looked at the uh, concentration of various species uh, at various times across this line uh, in the combustion chamber. So I'm going to show you some graphs then of what the soot concentration looks like along this line and various other species. Okay, so just to remind you, here's the path that we're looking at. So zero corresponds to the central part of, of this uh, reference line. Uh, and then uh, we travel out to the bore on either side. Uh, what you're seeing here is the situation for that rich combustion case, <coughs> top dead center. Um, remember, we're using the G equation model to calculate the flame propagation. You can see by looking at the temperature that the flame is located over here. It's propagating outwards. The G model solution is shown in the triangles here and it's equal to zero at, right at where the flame is located as we would expect, right? So the G model is doing, doing its job. It's showing us where the flame is located. If we look at the acetylene, we see that it has a peak right in the flame region here. And on this side, I'm also showing you on this plot, the pyrene, uh, which is also located uh, in, this, in the uh, uh, flame region. So basically, uh, the combustion is producing these species, which then feed into the soot model. Okay, you notice there was no soot in between in the burnt gas region. And the region, reason for that is shown here. Uh, here again is our uh, soot profile, and we, there's very little evidence of soot uh, inside this region. The region, reason for that is because we have OH in the burnt gas, which is oxidizing those soot particles. So basically, uh, we, uh, we note that here's our oxygen profile. Uh, this is a log scale here, right? So very little oxygen left in the burnt gas. We have OH and whatever little oxygen is left oxidizing the soot uh, left behind the flame. This is what you see at top dead center again for this, the number density of the soot particles. Again, it's a log plot here. And the soot particle size. You can see the peak size uh, is on the order of 150 nanometers uh, right in the flame region. Okay, um, if we look at uh, 80 degrees after top dead center, this is what we see. The flame is now propagated out toward the liner. Uh, in fact, the flame propagation has ended. Uh, most of the soot now resides uh, near the walls. You'll notice this is not symmetric because we had a pent roof chamber and the chamber is not symmetric. Um, I'm looking also at the uh, OH, the downward uh, facing triangles here. And you see that in the region where there's still OH available, soot has been oxidized. The number density is pretty uniform across the chamber, but the particles in the region where I'm showing the soot having been oxidized are very, very small. Uh, peak particle sizes near the wall are on the order of 100 or 200 nanometers. Okay, so how does this compare with experiments? There's good news and there's bad news. So the good news is uh, that the trends that I'm going to show you here, uh, some of the trends are matched. So here's the experimental data obtained by uh, Dave Rathammer's group at the Engine Research Center, where they measured engine out particulate size distributions versus particle size for those different equivalence ratios. And what they found was that for the lean cases, all the way up to equivalence ratios close to 1.2, 1.3, uh, basically the particle size distribution out of the engine looked very, very similar. 
It's only when you went to rich cases that you started to see more of these large sized particles like we were showing in the prediction, 100 nanometer sized particles. So uh, that's what is measured uh, in the experimental data. So here are the simulation results. So good news is that if you look at the red and the black curves, we are predicting that we're seeing larger amounts of large particles uh, in the model. Uh, however, we see kind of a different trend here for the lean mixture results and the small particle sizes. Uh, we don't really understand why that is. The models are still, they still need work, obviously. But one thing that we're starting to wonder about is um, what are you really measuring when you measure soot particle size? Uh, if you, we'll discuss this later as well when we talk about after treatment. But soot consists of what is called elemental carbon, and there's also organic carbon contribution to soot. So the elemental part is just carbon, and that's what we're modeling in the discussion here. The organic part is condensed hydrocarbon species, heavy, high molecular weight uh, hydrocarbon species that condense onto the soot particles. And in low temperature combustion strategies in particular, the elemental part and the organic part uh, are completely different than in conventional diesel or uh, conventional spark ignition engine particulates. Uh, and in particular, the elemental part, the condensed fuel part, becomes much larger than the, the I'm sorry, the, the organic part becomes much larger than the elemental part for low temperature combustion. And so one thought is that maybe uh, we're missing some parts of the organic contribution to the particulates, but that's just speculation. Okay, so um, I'm not gonna have time to go into this in detail, but we have also made soot predictions for uh, diesel engine combustion, and you can take a look at the results in the notes here. Um, but this, just let me finish off this part of the uh, presentation to describe kind of where we're going, and I'll talk more about this uh, when I talk about after treatment. So basically we have, for gasoline diesel fuels, we have these uh, soot precursor species, as I've described, that basically lead to uh, formation of um, uh, cetylene or propargyl and the uh, PAH species. Uh, we have coagulation and basically soot particle formation competing with oxidation steps. And that's all great, but if you look at soot uh, under transmission electron microscope pictures, you see that these soot uh, particles really are like clusters of grapes here, right? Where these uh, are these particles that have uh, agglomerated to form this cluster. And if you analyze this, you can actually show that there's differences that correspond to higher hydrogen content regions, which would correspond to those organic uh, contributions, and higher carbon content regions, which, which, which would correspond to the elemental carbon. And we've only been modeling the elemental carbon so far. And these pictures here are filters that are taken, this is pictures taken from uh, filters at Oak Ridge National Lab for conventional diesel combustion, for partially premixed charge, uh, compression ignition, and for uh, RCCI combustion. And just what's captured on the filter, you can see, it looks completely different with these different combustion strategies. So what I'm really saying is that soot modeling uh, is uh, a, a really fruitful area for future research because we don't really have models that can handle this wide range of potential soot particle structure uh, at this time. So that's all I wanted to say in this part of the presentation today. Uh, we're gonna to be talking about sprays tomorrow. Any questions?